Hello. <coughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much for coming out to this uh, exciting event today, do you, even despite the weather. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Meng Cheng, uh, the John A. Edwardson Dean of College of Engineering, and the uh, Roscoe H. George Professor of Electrical Engineering to introduce the uh, Distinguished Lecture Series speaker today. Meng. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, welcome to the Purdue College of Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. This is a series that started at the beginning of 2018, and this is the third of the installation for this particular academic year. The goal of the series is to invite some of the most leading and distinguished leaders in the world of engineering to come to Purdue as we aspire to attain the pinnacle of excellence at scale. And today's topic is timely and critically important to the United States and to many countries around the world. And it's a topic where Purdue's School of Nuclear Engineering has been and will continue to play a unique and crucial role. So I am indeed very honored to introduce the distinguished lecturer today to Purdue. Director General Magwood has had a distinguished career with a unique background combining science and the arts from Carnegie Mellon University. And over the past two decades, Director General Magwood has been a leader in the United States and around the globe in the areas of nuclear safety, science, and technology. Now, without spending too much time eating into the actual lecture, I would summarize some of the major accomplishments, knowing that I must be missing quite a few along the way. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, Mr. Magwood became the director of the civilian side of DOE and established the Idaho National Laboratory during his tenure there. And later, he became one of the five commissioners at the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission of the United States. And as of four years ago, he became the Director General of the Paris-based NEA, Nuclear Energy Agency. This is a multi-agency international collaboration center with representatives from 33 countries. And in today's day and age, it is particularly important to hear the voices from somebody such as William Magwood as we venture into the future of nuclear energy. It is our distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you, Director General Magwood. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Dean. And it's a real pleasure to be back at Purdue. This is my third visit to Purdue over the years. Um, every time I come here, I have a different job, so you don't recognize me. Um, when I first visited, I was, as you mentioned, I was running the DOE Nuclear Engineering, Nuclear Educate, Nuclear Energy Program, um, where, I was at, where I did that for more than a decade. My second trip, I was an NRC commissioner. That was probably six or seven years ago. And now I'm here as Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency. So I'm looking forward um, to a discussion with all of you today. It's great to see a, a fantastic turnout. It was either me or the cookies. I'm suspecting it was probably more the cookies. But um, once you stop chewing the cookies, I'll, I'll make a few points. And if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. <clears throat> First, it's been a fantastic visit. We've on, I've only been here today, but we covered a lot of ground. I, I went to see uh, your research reactor, your critical facility, and some of the laboratories. 
had very good, very engaging conversations with your professors. You have a very, very uh, distinguished and expert faculty here. You should be very happy to uh, have an opportunity to work with them. Um, and my job today is to give you an overview of uh, some things that we're thinking about on the international framework. And I'll start by giving you just a quick snapshot of the Nuclear Energy Agency itself. Because I, I suspect that many of you have not heard much about the NEA, because the NEA um, is an organization that has worked almost exclusively in the government sector over the years. So we have a lot of government-government collaboration, but we have not historically done very much with academia or even really industry, so we're trying to change that now. So the NEA is an organization that was created 60 years ago this year, so we're now 60 years old. Um, life begins at 60 for a lot of people, but so we're, we're, we're 60 years old now. <clears throat> and we started off as a European-based organization. It was created in the aftermath of the Second World War as part of the reconstruction of Europe. So back in those days, European countries saw nuclear energy as the pathway to the future, so they wanted to band together to develop nuclear technology and apply it. Over the years, <clears throat> the NEA became a global organization. We now have 33 member countries that include uh, countries such as the United States, Japan, Korea, Canada, Mexico, Argentina, uh, so many countries around the world. And the thing that distinguishes the NEA from other international organizations is that most of our members are countries that have deep experience with the use of nuclear technology, countries that have long experience with nuclear regulation, nuclear research, countries that have operated nuclear power plants for many years. So that, that is the core of our membership. And what we do is we bring those countries together and their experts together to try to solve difficult problems through policy analysis and research and development. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, much of our work revolves around what we call standing technical committees. And I won't go through all these in any detail, but in essence, we have these eight committees um, upon which experts are designated by their member countries, and they're all government officials that come to the NEA to deliberate on complicated issues. And each one of these committees, and you can see they represent really the full breadth of civilian nuclear technology, nuclear safety, nuclear law, nuclear science, nuclear technology, is all captured by these committees. But each one of these committees has a very complex substructure, and I'd use nuclear science as an example. As you can see in this chart, nuclear science has expert groups and working parties and everything related, ranging from minor actinide management to criticality work, accident-tolerant fuels. So these are experts who come from academia, from laboratories, uh, from industry, to come together to try to solve specific issues and, in some cases, to conduct research and development. Um, all of the work of these, these groups gets compressed into reports that get issued by the NEA, about 30 reports a year, that are available free of charge online. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of our reports as we go forward. So any of the work that we do in any of these technical areas is available on our website free of charge, so I invite you to um, avail yourself of that. We are also the home for a variety of other special projects. Uh, many of you probably have heard of the Generation 4 International Forum. This is a collection of governments that have gotten together to develop next generation nuclear power technologies. That's under our framework. Uh, the Multinational Design Evaluation Program is leading regulators who are analyzing together jointly um, state-of-the-art technologies such as the AP-1000, the European Pressurized Water Reactor, VVVR technology from Russia, others. Um, the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation is a group of 66 countries that includes both highly developed countries such as you know, United States, Korea, and France, but also countries that aspire to develop nuclear technology in the future, such as African countries, countries in the Middle East, and countries from Southeast Asia. And they work together to compare notes on interesting issues such as what to do about nuclear waste, how to finance nuclear power plants, how to build human capital. Um, so these are all under our framework, as well as 22 major joint uh, research and development projects that are currently underway. And these projects range from projects that can take place over the course of decades. For example, we have a project that still is underway related to the use of the Holden reactor in Norway where, where at least until recently we were doing irradiation of fuel samples and materials um, to projects that last only a few years. And as examples of, of some of the shorter term projects, 
I decided to point to two that are related to the Fukushima Daiichi accident. Um, BSAF is a very interesting project. This is a project that applies scientific information from Fukushima Daiichi and compares that information to our severe accident codes. So there's many severe accident codes that have been developed in the United States, in France, in Japan, and other countries. And we compare those results from those codes about the accident to what we, what we actually experienced in, in Japan to see if they agree. Uh, the good news is they do agree. They agree quite well. And the codes agree pretty well among themselves. Another project, Serif, takes samples from the water from the Fukushima Daiichi plants and it does analysis to try to anticipate what the core debris inside the reactors might be composed of. All of this, of course, will be helpful in understanding the nature of severe accidents and understanding how to clean up these uh, facilities. So the Fukushima Daiichi accident obviously was something that had a big impact around the world, and I thought I should spend a few minutes on that. <clears throat> Over the years, I've actually started to talk about Fukushima Daiichi less because I think we've learned the lessons and we've moved forward. But I think for this group, it's important to just take a few minutes to, to review this because it is a very important incident. But perhaps not quite the revolutionary incident that a lot of people think it was. Um, soon after the accident, the Nuclear Energy Agency um, pulled together experts from regulatory agencies around the world, and we analyzed what was known. And the first thing that these experts came to, and these are experts representing all countries, including uh, countries such as Germany and Italy that later decided not to build nuclear power plants or continue nuclear power plants, the basic conclusion was that nuclear power plants in, their, in these countries are safe to operate. There was nothing that we learned about the Fukushima Daiichi accident that changed our minds about how nuclear plants were designed or constructed, how they're regulated, how they're operated. It really wasn't a, a, a major aha that told us that we were doing something wrong. But the nature of the nuclear business is to learn from experience. And one of the experiences that we did take from this is that we needed to do something to enable nuclear power plants to deal with extreme events. Um, because it's very clear that we can plan for earthquakes, we can plan for floods, but what happens in the case that the once in 100,000 year event takes place next week? What do we do about that? How do we recover from that? Also, and I'm going to spend some time on this subject, the accident revealed that we have to take more seriously this whole issue of what we later have, have now called the human aspects of nuclear safety, and I'll spend some time on that. So we've learned these big lessons. You have to understand you know, the natural hazards facing each plant. You have, to, you have to be able to recognize extreme events can happen, and that recovering from those events is as important as the initial design of the plant itself and that these human aspects have to be dealt with. So over the last several years, we've analyzed what has gone on around the world since the accident. And I'm very confident in saying the safety in really every country that we work with has been dramatically enhanced since 311. Um, not so much in terms of the day-to-day the -day operation. That hasn't changed very much. But the preparation for unusual events, the preparation for disaster is much, much stronger. Um, and I won't go through all these, we don't have really have time today, but if you go around to visit any nuclear power plant in NEA countries, and you will see equipment, procedures in place in case the unexpected happens to enable plants to recover from these unusual events, whether they be man-made events from terrorist attacks or unusual events such as large earthquakes or floods. And this is something uh, that we captured in this report, which is again available to you online. Um, now, there are some things, and as you heard from my background, I spent um, a lot of time as an NRC commissioner, and I was a commissioner when all this took place, and um, I can tell you, and I would love to spend some more time telling you, talking more about the Fukushima Daiichi accident, because it certainly was a pretty tense time at the NRC during this event, when we were watching the information coming in, trying to understand how to interpret what we were hearing and what we weren't hearing from Japan. Um, but in the end, our job became a matter of how to go forward. Um, and going forward meant that regulations had to change around the world. And there's some very, very important changes that have, been, have happened over the years that I wanted to highlight. One is, as, as I noted, there's a greater focus on extreme events. You know, after, after the accident, regulators and operators around the world are now 
preparing for these extreme events. And these are things that really had been considered beyond design basis before, but now not so much. And so we have this new equipment, we have new procedures, we have these, you know, in Europe they even have these, like, these special strike teams that will go to a nuclear plant just in case there's an accident to bring the equipment and experts to try to deal with an accident. One consequence of all this, however, is that we're now regulating, in effect, severe accidents. And this is a major sea change in regulation around the world. Um, in the past, severe accidents were considered beyond considered beyond design basis. And what that meant in effect was industry did not have to worry about it. Our job was to keep the severe accidents from happening. We put all the regulations in place, procedures in place to make sure the accidents never happened. But if they did happen, it was beyond design basis. We didn't expect the industry to, deal, to do anything with it. We now expect the industry to deal with severe accidents. And this, this creates a very uncertain ground for the industry going forward because the lines between design basis, things they're responsible for, and beyond design basis, things they were not responsible for, is now completely blurred. So this is a very, very important change. And so now, regula now regulators expect industry to mitigate severe accidents, which is the first time they've ever had to do that. Um, another thing, and this is something that's perhaps not necessarily a bad thing, is that the expectations of the public have changed a lot since the accident in Japan. We see around the world the public is much more engaged when it comes to dealing with new decisions involving the deployment, um, the extension of lives, the placement of nuclear waste, anything to do with nuclear, the public seems to have a greater appetite for involvement. I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but it does make things a bit more complicated. It means that things do take a bit more time because you have to do the public education, you have to do the public outreach to make sure that the public has enough information to make good decisions. And as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the th most important things that I think that we have pulled from this is recognizing that the human aspects of nuclear safety may actually be as important to the future of nuclear safety um, as anything we do with plant equipment and procedures. Uh, the technical aspects are extremely important, don't get me wrong. But I think that we have to put more effort in dealing with this human element. Uh, I will make a prediction that if there is another major nuclear accident, that when we do the analysis, it won't be because we failed in some area of design or we didn't have the right fuel or we didn't have the right protective systems or we didn't have the right regulation. It'll be because somebody somewhere didn't do their job. And that's something that we have to protect against. So we spent a lot of time at the NDA in the last few years on this, and I won't go through all these reports in detail, but each one of these reports focuses mostly on, on regulatory organizations and the safety culture that they have. And the, one of the more recent ones um, dealt with the safety culture of effective regulatory bodies. And this was a good report that we put together um, after bringing experts together from different countries to compare the notes on what they thought about the safety culture issue. Because when we went back and we looked at the Japanese accident, one of the things that became clearer was the regulator at the time, it was called NISA, um, had a very flawed safety culture. Um, they, were sac they were making decisions and that in effect sacrifice overall safety to make sure the industry moved forward quickly and effectively. They were compromised because of the way they were structured, because of the messages that were given within the organization, and this is something that I think everyone in hindsight recognizes was a big mistake because the regulator had many opportunities to make decisions that could have prevented the accident from happening but did not take action when it could have. So we focused a lot on the need for regulatory organizations to have the right leadership, to, to display the characteristic of safety culture for every individual um, to be responsible for safety. And that's something that I think is important for all of you, those of you who are in, going to be working in nuclear fields, to recognize that you have this personal responsibility for safety. No matter what your job is, no matter where you are in a vendor, in a laboratory, in a design organization, you always have to remember that you, you are responsible for safety. If something goes wrong, you don't want to be the person that's asking yourself the question the day after, is this because of something I should have done that I didn't do? You want to make sure that you take personal responsibility and that you hold others around you responsible as well. And this is something that's important in regulatory organizations, but also very important in operational organizations as well. Um, one area I wanted to highlight, because this is actually quite interesting, 
is that in the process of doing this report, one conclusion that came out was that it's very important the characteristics of national culture should not be view, viewed as an impediment to safety, but rather as characteristics and cultural strengths to be aware of and used and fostered in developing safety culture. So this sound, doesn't sound like a very controversial statement, but it actually was within nuclear circles internationally. People don't like talking about this. Uh, we forced them to talk about it because we thought it was important. And in essence, what it says is that safety culture is not a completely universal concept. Safety culture is a bit different if you're looking at it from an American perspective versus a, a French perspective versus a Russian perspective versus a, a Japanese perspective. And it's not that the, the basic principles of safety culture are different, but how you communicate them and how you reinforce them, those could be very different. So how do we deal with this? Well, we put together something called the Country Specific Safety Culture Forum. And I won't go through all the details of this, but basically what we've done is we put together a framework where countries can run through exercises to analyze this issue of national culture and how it affects safety culture. Um, we've done it now once so far with Sweden. Sweden volunteered for this, and we found out all the flaws in Swedish culture that lead to problems in safety culture. It was really a very fascinating exercise. We had about 50 people, uh, both in rate from regulators and operators within Sweden, who participate in a day and a half exercise to analyze this, and it went extremely well. We issued a report um, that is now available on our website. I won't go through all this detail, but that's what the report looks like. Uh, the next one is going to be held in Finland uh, this spring, and we've been asked to hold similar workshops in about five other countries, so we're now organizing ourselves to do this on a regular basis. And my hope is eventually we'll have a library of reports like this so we can analyze this whole issue of safety culture in a very realistic way. And, and hopefully this will start to plug some of the holes in safety culture vulnerability that we have around the world. Also, as I mentioned, public engage, engagements have become very important. So we spend a lot of time on this as well. And you know, I, I'm highlighting these non-technical factors because I don't think they get enough attention in a lot of the venues that I think that people like you deal with because you're a very technical group, you're engineers, you're scientists, and you never probably give much thought to things like culture and public communications. But the future of nuclear power probably depends a lot more on these issues than anything that will be happening in laboratories around the world over the next 10 years. Because if the public doesn't think that regulators and operators are listening to what they're saying and understanding what their concerns are and responding to those concerns, uh, they won't allow the industry to go forward. So this, these things are very important. So we had an exercise that brought together about, a, about 140 senior government officials from different areas. Uh, these are people who were operations types, they were regulators, they were in charge of nuclear waste. We brought them all together and we put them in a room together and we made them talk to each other for three days. And they had these very productive roundtable discussions and they reached some conclusions. And uh, I'll just highlight these very quickly because I think they're really, they're, they're of some interest. Uh, one thing is that all situations are different, all countries are different, all, 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 all circumstances are different. So there's no one size fits all approach. There's no magic solution to how to engage with the public. But that officials in the industry have to just simply take the time to engage. Um, don't just put information on a website and send it out and expect you've done your job. You have to sit down and talk to people. You have to answer their questions. You have to listen to their concerns. Um, we also found that uh, bringing younger people into these conversations is very important because nuclear activities take so long to germinate and take so long to bring the conclusion that it makes a lot of sense to bring younger generations into the conversation because in cases like nuclear waste, um, they'll be dealing with it their whole adult life, lives. So it makes sense to bring them involved in these conversations. But also recognize that bringing people into these conversations is not a voting process. It's still a technical exercise that you're trying to inform the public about. So it doesn't mean at the end of a, a session with the public, everyone raises their hand who's in favor. It's not the way this works. But it's important to hear all their concerns. Um, so again, this face-to-face -face personal interaction is really key. These, these, these various officials came to these conclusions. Um, there's another report that's available on our website. And, and I think that the, the bottom line that we walked away with was that it's important for officials to look at these necessities of interacting with the public as not a burden, but an opportunity, an opportunity to communicate their message 
and to get their points across and to help educate the public because these, is the, these discussions will continue over the course of long periods of time. Now this is all very important because we believe that there's going to be a strong role for nuclear power in the future, but we have to deal with these soft issues as we go forward. Now obviously, the development of the Paris Accord back in 2015 is something that has galvanized a lot of discussion about nuclear. Um, we have a lot of mechanisms on the international framework that deal with um, how to address climate change issues, how to reduce CO2, and one thing that's been very interesting is to recognize that as these conversations go on and you listen to these international bodies discuss climate change, they have a strange tendency to not talk about energy very much, which is very strange to me, but it does happen. We're trying to fix that, but, but it, it does go on. But energy represents really 60% of the whole issue when it comes to CO2 emissions. So it's very important that we look at this from an energy standpoint and to grow from there. Now, this is a very interesting chart that just tracks some recent history. If you look at this chart, you see that um, the U.S., for example, uh, which is, I think, the light blue line, has been doing very well when it comes to reducing CO2 emissions, largely through switching from coal to natural gas. Uh, Europe, their emissions have been trending downwards as well, combination of factors, including some deindustrialization. Uh, the interesting ones are probably Germany, which is kind of leveled off, and the most recent data, which is not shown in this chart, shows German emissions starting to trend back up again. And Japan, of course, which has this big spike, that's the red line, which is what happened when all the Japanese plants were shut down after Fukushima Daiichi and they went to using LNG. Um, and you see their emissions have spiked. And they're now trying to figure out how in the world do they get their, um, their programs back on track. Now, the, the interesting country, of course, is at the bottom there, which is France. And you notice France is way, way below everyone else. And among the major industrialized countries, very, very few can say this, but France right now, as of today, is one country that meets COP21 requirements when it comes to energy right now, today. And why is that? Because they use 78% of, nuclear provides 78% of their electricity supply. Now they don't seem to want to keep it that way. They want to reduce the reliance on, on nuclear and increase renewables, which means their emissions will go up, but that's another conversation. But this shows you how nuclear plays into this conversation. Even a relatively modest number of nuclear power plants in an economy the size of, of, of Japan or France has a major impact on this issue. And I think that I, when I look at this, it's not just about climate change, it's really about air quality in general. So I look at, I look at this as an analog for what air quality looks like in countries overall. And as you can see from this, in France, it's pretty good right now. So one would think they'd want to keep it, but that's, that's certainly a national conversation. So we have a sister organization, the International Energy Agency. They do a lot of broad economic analysis, and this is a chart they put together a few years ago that shows the answer to the question, if we are to meet the COP21 requirements and reduce CO2 emissions dramatically, what does energy look like in 2050? And their answer was basically, well, we need a lot of everything. We need, we need a lot of renewables, we need carbon sequestration, but we also need a major contribution globally from nuclear. And nuclear is a big blue band in the middle there, and that's equivalent to about two and a half times increased current nuclear capacity globally. And so that's a pretty, that's a pretty heroic increase over that period of time. Uh, we're talking about the equivalent of something like 500 large nuclear power plants built around the world between now and, and say 2040 or so. Um, it's hard to see how we do that at this point. It certainly is possible we have built at that rate in the past, but we don't see the kind of impediments right now to make this a reality. Um, and, um, and I think I want to focus a little bit on why I think it's going to be difficult to make that work. Um, let me start with this. Is nuclear cost competitive? Well, whenever we talk about the cost competitiveness of various energy technologies, it's very common to, re to refer to the levelized cost of generating electricity. And this chart shows that, particularly if you include some costs of carbon, nuclear does very well. And this is a report that we did a, few, a, a while back that focuses on how do you compare these various technologies in the case where there's about, I think it's about a $30 per ton um, cost of carbon. 
Nuclear does very well. Nuclear is cheaper than uh, most renewables. Nuclear is cheaper than a lot of the fossil fuels. Very competitive, looks like a very good story. And if this, is where, if this was exactly how people make decisions, it would make me feel a lot better. But what we have discovered, and just through practice, this is not how people make decisions about what to, what to build. They make decisions on what to build more on how much do things cost to construct. And this is one where we're not doing very well. Now, the funny thing about this chart is it actually understates recent experience on how much nuclear power plants have been costing. This shows a, a cost of about $6,000 per installed kilowatt, which is actually significantly below what we've seen in the last few projects. But this was, this was, a, this was a, a very, um, an average estimate to look at the projects all around the world. And you can see in this chart that nuclear is just this completely out of bounds spike. This is not sustainable. If we can't bring these costs down, then it's hard to see how nuclear could ever achieve the kind of deployment that we were showing in the earlier chart. This is our big challenge, I think. How do we deal with this? How do we get those costs down? How much of this is related to the technology itself, and how much of this is related to our ability to, to build and deploy nuclear plants cost effectively? This is something that we have to deal with, and we'll talk a little bit about this again in a minute. Now, when I'm, we're making these comparisons, I also I have to hasten to point out that this is based on today's markets as they are structured. But I am willing to say to you uh, t today, well, I got one more chart here first. This, this speaks to uh, recent experience in the US about plant closures. And I think you're familiar with this story. Um, we've lost a lot of plants already. There's a much many more on the chopping block. And a lot will depend on the market. A lot depends on how these plants are cost, how much they cost to operate in the markets they, they exist in. And as you know, in the United States in particular, we have very, very low energy prices because of natural gas, and there's also an impact from subsidized renewables, and this is driving base load plants, particularly nuclear plants, out of market prices, and this is a big problem. But as I was, as I was starting to say a minute ago, a lot of this depends on what you think the market looks like. And what we think, and after looking at this, not just in the US, but in many other countries, the markets in many countries are broken. They don't work. Um, and I'll give you a very tangible example. We have been looking at the case of uh, Swiss hydroelectric facilities that were built back in the 1950s, fully depreciated facilities that simply generate electricity. That's all they do all day, generate electricity. They're losing money in Switzerland. So if you, have hydro, if, you have, if you have depreciated hydro facilities losing money, that should tell you something about your markets, that your markets don't work, your markets are broken. So markets in a lot of the countries we work with are completely dysfunctional. And there's lots of reasons for that, but um, part of it is that the markets don't reflect the true cost of generating electricity. We often see these comparisons that look at the cost of generating electricity from, say, wind turbines versus nuclear, and nuclear always looks much, much higher than that. But the reality is that when you look at what those costs reflect, they almost never reflect the, co the costs associated with transmission access, the costs associated with storage, the costs associated with backup energy supply, the costs associated with the impact on the grid itself, which is not insignificant. It's actually a very large impact. These costs are never accounted for. And then if you include it beyond that, the, external, the externality costs associated with societal impacts, environmental impacts, that is probably what the true cost is. Now I'm not saying necessarily that we should change all our markets to reflect all these costs, but if you're making decisions about what to build in the future, why would you not include these costs in your calculation? It just simply makes sense to do it that way. But we are not doing that today. We're starting to advocate that and people are starting to understand now that they have to take these costs into consideration when they make decisions. Otherwise, they're just making the wrong decisions. But as of today, we're seeing nuclear plants going offline around the world because their costs are not being compared correctly with other resources. So because of that, and this is a scenario we did a, a while back, where we asked the question, the first, the first chart says basically, um, if nuclear were allowed to expand um, if you had a, a carbon price was high enough to price fossil fuels out of the market, and that's typically about 100 to $120 per, uh, per ton of carbon. If you had a carbon tax that big, 
how well does nuclear do? Well, the re nuclear is the red one. So if nuclear is allowed to go on, uh, you see nuclear takes over the market. All right, yay, okay. But what you find is to the degree that because of the cost of nuclear, to the degree that renewables are available, renewables push nuclear out of the market just because of the, co the, co the capital cost of building nuclear power plants. So this shows that even if you have a large carbon tax, um, the cost of building plants becomes prohibitive and it, it drives nuclear out of the market. I was participating in a discussion that was held just about a week ago in Washington where industry experts were brought together and we had several utility executives who were in the room and we asked the question, if there were a carbon tax, would you build nuclear power plants today? Every one of them said, absolutely not. And we said, why? They said, it's because building a nuclear power plant today under these circumstances is a bet the company proposition and we're not gonna do it. It's just that simple. It, you have to have a lot more clarity on cost and schedule than we have been able to affect. Now, why can't we have better cost and schedule performance? We should be able to. Other countries have done it. You know, Korea does a very good job. Uh, the Chinese are doing, are doing well, in, at least inside China. The Russians have proven they can do it. What is it that they can do that we can't do? And the simple answer is that we have stopped building plants, and when you don't build plants on a regular basis, you're not very good at it. And so we don't have the experienced project managers, we don't have the established supply chains, and we have to rebuild that. Um, one of the, the sad things, we were actually having this discussion a little bit this morning, is that after the experience of building the AP1000s in South Carolina where the project did fail and Georgia where the project continues, we've made a lot of good progress in reestablishing supply chains, reestablishing expertise. But the question is, when will we have the chance to build the next AP1000 in order to take advantage of that? And that's, that's, that's a significant question. So, some observations. Renewables are going to be deployed in significant numbers. Now, you can debate what magnitude of de deployment there will be over the course of time. Um, this is something one can argue about. Some people think it'll be 30 or 40 percent. Some people think it'll be 80 percent. Whatever you think, there's going to be a lot of renewables. And that's going to dramatically alter how we handle electricity in our markets. Natural gas prices are historic lows. And it looks like from everything that I have seen that we're expecting to see that continue for a long period of time. So it's not going to change quickly. It might even be decades before we see prices crawl back up. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the lack of practice in countries like the US and European countries has really made it very difficult to build plants. On the other hand, according to Eurostat, which is a, obviously a European organization, um, EU has increased um, CO2 emissions 1.8% as of 2017, despite a 25% increase in wind and solar, or wind power and 6% growth in solar. So renewables are going up, emissions are going up, and also prices are going up. So this seems like an opportunity for nuclear, doesn't it? Um, so while electric, and also, Renewables don't help much with another very important aspect of energy, which is, which is process heat. Today, around the world, the United States, Europe, Japan, everywhere, we rely very, very heavily on coal and gas um, to provide process heat for industrial processes. And no one has really been talking about that very much. They should be talking about that because that's a very significant part of CO2 emissions. Nuclear can address this issue. And there's a lot of countries who are talking about that today. So in that context, with the combination of this need to deal with, with process heat, the need to deal with the increased cost of, of building plants, nuclear has a real opportunity for the future, but there's going to have to be some kind of adaptation. And that's something that we are, we are giving a lot of thought to. So we have to improve the cost effectiveness and flexibility of nuclear. We have to deal with the fact that the countries are going to expect these very high levels of safety, but we have to control costs while doing that. Um, we have to deal with the continuing concerns that policymakers in different countries have with proliferation issues, uh, which I often think get overblown, but they are there, so you have to deal with them. Uh, we have to deal with nuclear waste. Um, that's something that's, that's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, in general, nuclear has a fit in whatever the future energy structure in the world is going to be. Nuclear has to be cost-effective, it has to be safe, it has to be flexible. There's no question about that. 
So how do we get from here to there? Well, when I, I started thinking about our current technologies, and we have very good technology. If you look at the light water reactor technologies on the market today, we have excellent technology, AP1000, um, even the VVR technologies out of Russia, some of the newest plants that you see um, from, from Europe, such as the EPR, very, very good technologies, very safe, um, cost-effective we're, we're, we're working on. And, and despite the accident in Japan, nuclear has an excellent safety record. You know, I, I, I have no trouble going to really any country um, that has an advanced, advanced industrial infrastructure and saying, yes, you can use nuclear power as the basis of your future electricity supply because it's safe. I have no problem saying that. I have a lot of confidence in the safety of nuclear power. And the fact that nuclear is the only reliable, dispatchable, zero emission technology that exists today um, means that it should be on the table for consideration. At the same time, you know, this bet the company reputation is, is very, very hard to deal with right now. So we have to find a way to convince companies that they are not betting the company when they start a nuclear project. We also have to be, take seriously this, this issue of the cost. You know, nuclear plants, these, these traditional nuclear plants, they cost a lot to build, they cost a lot to operate, and they cost a lot to regulate. It's just the nature of the technology for the most part. We still have to deal with nuclear waste disposal, as I mentioned, and we have to deal with the public concerns of safety in many countries. You know, the U.S. has not been a place where the safety issue has been as, as, as hot as it is in some other places, but if you go to countries that are near, uh, the, near Japan that, that were, had experience of uh, watching the Fukushima Daiichi accident, people really are afraid of nuclear power. It's just that simple. It's, it's something you see when you talk to people. It's, it's a very emotional uh, thing with them, so you can't just talk them out of it. So small modular reactors, certainly a step in the right direction. Um, a new deployment model, a way of perhaps more cost-effectively building nuclear capacity with more flexibility, um, the, the ability of these small modular reactors to come, in, come in on and offline very quickly, makes them more flexible, reduces the cost of operation. The fact they can be manufactured in, 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 in factory means the quality will be much higher, cost certainty is much higher, Schedule certainty is much higher. So this is something we're quite excited about. And safety is something that, that doesn't get talked about quite as much. And when you look at many of the designs, and I, won't, I, have to, I hasten to say that not all SMRs are the same. And you should not speak of them as just a, a, a class. They're all very different. But many of them are characterized by, by very, very large water inventories. And those large water inventories make the past the safety characteristics of the systems very, very compelling. So these technologies have a lot of good things to say for themselves. There's still some questions that have to be worked out by regulators, particularly one issue that will be very interesting will be, you know, can we have uh, basically a site boundary EPZ, emergency planning zone? That's going to be a big issue the NRC will be dealing with probably over the next year. But also safety, control room staffing, things like that all have to be resolved. But at the same time, even with these technologies, the costs are still higher than the market today can sustain. And so we have to really do what we can to try to reduce those costs. Um, we've been working on Generation 4 for almost 20 years now. You know, we started Generation 4 in National Forum, the very first meeting, I was just talking to Susie about this, the very first meeting of Generation 4 took place in January 2000. And so now it's, it's, it's now almost 20 years ago that we started this enterprise. There's been a huge amount of research. We just had a conference in Paris on Generation 4 International Forum. We had 250 papers presented from different parts of the world. Very exciting. Nothing has been demonstrated yet. You know, so, we, so we talked about it. We're researching it. We're doing a lot of academic work. We're doing a lot of laboratory work, but we haven't taken that step. Um, so why, why are we taking so long to do this? And one thing is that there's these innovation headwinds. It's really hard to do nuclear innovation these days. You know, one thing is infrastructure. You know, it's, it's very, many of you know, we've lost a lot of infrastructure over the last 20 years, both in the United States and around the world. Um, really pleased that, you know, DOE is making really good progress on universal test reactor, something that's been um, being discussed for a long time. But if you look at most of the infrastructure, we've lost a lot more than we've gained. We've lost, react, we've lost infrastructure in Japan, we've lost infrastructure in Europe, we've lost infrastructure in the United States. In, in the 1990s, we shut down so much infrastructure in the U.S. 
that it's, it's just almost hard to imagine what we lost. And these are things that cost billions of dollars to replace, so it's hard to put it back once you lose it. Um, regulators, and this is something we're having a very vibrant conversation about within the NEA. How do you get regulators to be more friendly to new innovative technologies? The truth is regulators, and I'm a former regulator, I'm willing to say this so I can say it, regulators don't think it's their job to be innovative. Regulators think it's their job to protect safety. And so it's hard to pull regulators into this conversation about innovation because they don't think it's their responsibility to be innovators. They think it's their responsibility to make sure that whatever industry presents, they analyze, they look at it, and make a judgment. But the reality is that for innovation to be successful, we have to get regulators to involve themselves as early as possible in the process so that the researchers can do the right, can work on the right problems. And so we're, we're working on this now, trying to get regulators into this conversation. It is not easy. And finally, this cost. So we have a small modular reactor design called New Scale. I think all of you have probably heard about this. It's very exciting technology. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that when I was running the DOE program, we gave the first grant that made New Scale, that got New Scale moving in the first place. This was back in, I think, 1999, as I recall. I think it was 1999. Yes, he's that, he's that old. Um, that we gave the first grant to, um, the, to Oregon State University that ultimately became what is today New Scale. That's how long this has taken to do. So this started in 1999, that's 20 years ago. And they're still in the middle of the RNRC process. And they've spent almost a billion dollars without building anything yet. That's how long this takes, that's how much it costs. It is not something for the faint of heart. Um, building new nuclear technologies is a very expensive undertaking. And quite frankly, unless you've got two or three billion dollars burning a hole in your pocket, you probably shouldn't even start. So that's how hard this is. So these are very important barriers to progress. You know, if you want to develop a new wind technology, you probably just need a few million dollars and you're off to the races, you can get it done. In nuclear, you have to make these big investments. You have to have this infrastructure and you have to have regulators willing to work with you. So this gets to what I call the vision thing. Now, we just, we just saw the passing of President George H.W. Bush and this, this phrase, the vision thing, in a completely different context of something that was ascribed to him. He had the misfortune of being the president that came after Ronald Reagan, who was a very visionary type of president. You know, but in, in, in President Bush was much more of a pragmatic, day-to-day -day manager of the, of the government. I think he did a very good job, but he, but he struggled whenever people said, well, what's your vision? And he made this reference to say, that's that vision thing again, right? Well, where we are today is we have this vision problem. We lack vision. And this chart is one that I actually first put together years ago when I was at the NRC. And I noticed something kind of interesting. We have our, our friend from NASA here today. I promised her I'd show her a chart. Uh, this is a picture of um, Glenn Seaborg, who I think all the, all the nuclear people are familiar with, uh, who at the time was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, taken with James Webb. Uh, who was then the administrator of NASA back in July 1961. And they had come together to sign an agreement to apply space to explore the, the solar system. So here's these two top officials that came together um, for this signing ceremony, talking about something that in all likelihood would never reach any fruition um, in, during their lifetimes. But why did they do it? Because they had a vision. This is the thing that we have to stress today. We need to have a vision. If we don't have a vision for the future, then, what we're, then there's no context for anything that we're doing. So I, I have this chart, I won't go through this in any detail, but if you track the progress of both NASA and the Atomic Energy Commission over the course of time, you see something really interesting. Um, they both started in the 1950s with not a whole lot. You know, the AEC sort of inherited the Manhattan Project assets. NASA had V2 rockets that they sort of consistently blew up on the launch pad. <laughs> uh, but over the succeeding 15 years, it's an amazing success story. Both NASA and the AEC created technologies that were just remarkable in the period of time. The Atomic Energy Commission es essentially created nuclear, civilian nuclear technology during that period. You know, light wire reactors, fast reactors, gas reactors, um, space nuclear systems, medical isotopes, enrichment, reprocessing just about 15 years. 
And then NASA, of course, you know, put a, put a man on the moon in 1969. Amazing accomplishments, considering where they started. In the 1970s, both started to plateau a bit for lots of different reasons, cost issues, political issues, lots of different issues. And today, it's kind of depressing. You know, both organizations have really not shown a lot of progress over the last few years, have very little they can point to today of accomplishment in terms of, of, of new feats they've accomplished in terms of either exploring space or, um, or, or expanding the use of, of nuclear technology. And I think a lot of this is ascribed to the fact that we have lost our vision. We aren't people who are looking over the horizon as much as we used to. Now, I've tried what I can do at the NEA to try to correct this. We started a program called Nuclear Innovation 2050, and we pulled together experts from around our member countries, and we asked this question, so what do we need to do? If you believe that there's a future for nuclear technology, what is that future? What, do, what technologies do we need to have in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 50 years, and how do we collaborate with each other to try to achieve that? And one result of that was a chart like this that where we highlighted after all the experts came together and they said these are the areas that we think require the most focus. And I, again, I won't go through all of these, but they basically are areas where the community has come together and said these are where the priorities ought to be. We ought to focus on things like advanced manufacturing. We ought to focus on uh, nuclear process, heat and cogeneration, hybrid systems, Gen 4 technologies, advanced recycling. They think we ought to focus on those areas. So we selected one as a starting point, and one that we selected was, a, was accident tolerant fuels. And so we're putting a big effort to try to bring people together with accident tolerant fuels. So we have started to put together activities to bring together industry, government officials, regulators, laboratories, research reactor facilities, bring them all together and say, how do we move this forward much, much more quickly than we've been able to do in the past? Based on our previous experience, it takes about 20 years to put a new nuclear fuel into operation from concept to, to implementation. We just can't spend 20 years talking about technologies like this anymore. We have to do it faster. So that's something we were doing, and I brought a copy, and uh, Dr. Kim, I'm going to give you a copy of this. Enjoy. <laughs> and, um, and I have a few, co few other copies here, so maybe you can give these to some of your colleagues. Um, and so this is something that we have to spend more effort. We have to establish a vision. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we can't do this from an international organization. Each country has to develop its own vision. Um, I, I'm really hopeful to see that there's some changes that have been taking place at DOE, DOE over the last year or so that sort of show that we're beginning to formulate a vision and we've got new leadership coming in, so we're going to see what's going to happen there. Um, but you look around the world, and it's really not a pretty story. We don't look over the horizon. We don't look at what, we'll, what is the world we're trying to create. We're, we're too busy looking at uh, the short term. So finally, the question I often get asked, well, you know, everybody's retiring. Who's going to do all this work? Who's going to develop these technologies? Well, obviously, hopefully, a lot of the people in this room will be there. But when you look around many countries, there are not nearly, now, the U.S. is pretty unique. And, you know, one of the things that we were able to do during my tenure at DOE was we were able to encourage universities to maintain and expand their nuclear education programs. Um, it was back during the mid-90s, and we reached a point, believe it or not, where in the entire United States, there were 480 undergraduates in nuclear engineering. Total, total country, 480. Um, and we saw it as a crisis, so we stepped up, and I'm quite proud of what we were able to accomplish. The last numbers I've heard, we were north of 5,000, so obviously something went right. <laughs> um, but in a lot of countries, this is not the case. In a lot of countries, you know, kids are not going into nuclear. So we're tr what we're trying to do now is we're trying to encourage more, more um, young people to get into nuclear, nuclear engineering. And a um, program that we have launched is called NEST, uh, Nuclear Education Skills and Technology Framework. And in short order, what this is, is this is a, a collection of multinational research projects that are done by university students. Um, in some cases, you might have students from, um, from Purdue, 
working with students from the University of Tokyo, working with students from Seoul National University, working with students um, from University of Manchester, all on a single research project, being coordinated by an expert researcher in a laboratory somewhere. Um, our hope is that this will revive the kind of excitement that people used to have on large research and development programs um, by showing that there's an international interest, a chance for international relationships and coordination to do something big and complicated, but also to do something practical. These are not make-work projects. They are always going to be projects that have a very, very practical aspect. So we're getting this off the ground now. We've got 11 countries that have signed up to participate in this, including countries that might surprise you, like Germany and Italy, for example, which, which, which are moving away from nuclear power. But nevertheless, they all recognize they have to have subject matter experts that have this expertise in, in nuclear. So um, hopefully, um, as time goes on, we'll see a proposal from Purdue, and uh, we'll get you involved in that. So some concluding thoughts, and um, yes, I think we'll have about five minutes left for questions. Um, just to wrap it all up, that to meet the energy environment requirements, traditional light water reactors are likely to be needed for a long, long time. Uh, today's light water reactors aren't going anywhere anytime soon. We're building reactors today, and reactors that are being built today will be around for 60 or 80 years. So light water reactor technology is around uh, for the foreseeable future. SMRs are an exciting new area. They might solve some of the, the problems that we see, but even SMRs have some challenges. And so I think in the longer term future, we have to really give some thought to fission energy for the future. What is the fission energy for 2050, for 2060? It might be light water, but it might be something else, and I don't think we should be afraid of that. I, I'm, I'm willing to change, you should be willing to change too, because I think it's time to at least open our minds to the possibility that light water reactor technology um, has served us well, but maybe the future is, looks a little bit different. And if we don't make change, if we don't adapt, if we don't find better ways of doing business, we may have seen the, the peak use of fission energy already. And that would be a tragedy, not just for the nuclear industry, not just for nuclear education programs, but really for all of global society. Because I don't think we can meet our energy and environmental goals without nuclear. I'm absolutely convinced of that. So if nuclear doesn't succeed, we as a society won't succeed in what we want to do. So if this is going to change, then the time to change is now. We can't wait another 10 years. We can't wait another 20 years. We have to start today. We have to start now. And I think that many of you in this room will probably be some of the people that help propel this forward and to take us where we want to go. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. If you, if you have any questions, yeah. You highlighted the accomplishments of NASA and the AEC in putting a man on the moon and building the first commercial nuclear power plant, respectively. Uh, do you think that small private startups in the nuclear power industry can succeed without so significant aid from the government? Um, in nuclear? Yes, in nuclear, nuclear power. No, and they can't succeed in space either because if you look at the progress that's happened with um, Elon Musk's organization, it's because NASA created an economic framework that made it possible. It didn't happen by itself. They wouldn't have gone off and spent the money they spent if they didn't have this clarity as to how NASA was going to pay them to use those systems to move things into orbit. Um, and I think sim something similar could certainly happen, in fact, we've had this conversation, something similar could happen with nuclear. Um, you, could have a, you could imagine a situation where, um, where the government agrees to buy um, nuclear power from advanced systems um, at a certain price to encourage people to build the systems. I mean, those are there are mechanisms the government can take. It doesn't have to just simply be just throwing money at the situation, it, but it can have to create the economic framework to make it possible. So the answer is no. It can't be done without the government doing something somehow. And that's not going to change anytime soon because even, you know, I've, I've, I've been spending a lot of time talking with the TerraPower people, and, you're, you know, that's the Bill Gates-funded reactor system. Um, and a lot of people think they went to work with the Chinese originally because of regulatory challenges. 
that was certainly the popular wisdom. But the truth is, they were looking for someone who was going to, willing to spend $2 billion to build a demonstration facility. So money, money, money in this new area is essential. You have to be able to spend large amounts of money to bring these systems to fruition. But these um, small companies are huge generators of, of, of really bright ideas. The question is, how do you harness all that energy and bright ideas and bring it to practical implementation? And that's, that's kind of where I think we are right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have time for additional questions. If there is any. Natalie? Uh, so you talked a little bit about all the different systems that they're working on right now. Like, looking into the future, how do you know which ones to invest in? That question comes up a lot because um, I think that governments in general, and we ha we've had some very substantive conversations with some governments about this recently. Governments, I think, have lost some confidence that they know how to select technologies. So their tendency is to try to develop a market-based approaches to encourage the markets to make those decisions. Um, I'm a bit skeptical about that because it, it's the market. The market needs a lot of help to function. And so, what is? How do you create that environment to to both harness a market, not wisdom, but at the same time have the government provide the resources? And again, that's something I think we're still trying to figure out. However, one thing I would say, and this is a, this is actually a real this is a, a real time conversation we're having with senior officials in many in many governments. One thing that we are talking about is look is working with private sector uh, power companies and getting working with them to solicit their perspective on what they think is going to be needed in the rel in, in the intermediate future. It's kind of hard to look at the long term future, but certainly if you look at the next twenty or thirty years. Power companies have the best perspective on this, so we're, we're looking at the possibility of consulting with the power companies that try to set up a requirements document. And this is something that we did in the past. Now, the, in the past, if it actually wasn't done by the governments, the, the power companies, may, maybe you remember this, had a utility requirements document that the, that the industry put together by itself to lay out what they thought was needed, and that actually led to the development of technologies like the AP1000, ultimately. So. Um, I think the power companies might be the next step to look to try to figure out what is the right technology. But ultimately, we're going to have to put a lot of ideas on the table and see which ones uh, rise to the top. Thank you. Thank you. I saw a question over there somewhere. Um, so obviously, energy security is a big issue in the future. And um, I guess my question is, you had talked about um, different countries developing their own visions for nuclear. And I'm wondering how you see um, international cooperation playing into like the development of those visions, perhaps to work together. I love this question. <laughs> Well, um, that's kind of what we do. You know, we are trying to get that to happen. It's not easy because, really, as you pointed out, you know, countries are kind of moving in different directions in different ways. But at the end of the day, when I sit and I talk with, with, with key people in different countries, they will tell me, we can't do this by ourselves. We don't have the money. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the people. We just can't do this by ourselves. We need we need to work with the United States. We need to work with Japan. We need to work with others, and so I, I think that there is a very strong, compelling need for countries to do things together, uh, because the costs, the difficulty, it does encourage some sharing of the risk, but also, and this is perhaps even more important, if nuclear is going to be successful. It's got to have, the next nuclear technologies have to have big markets. Um, we cannot have what we've done in the past, which is we go through lots of trouble, we spend billions of dollars developing a new technology, and then we build three. You know, that's not, that's not going to work in the future. And, uh, you know, Dr. Kim and I were just having this conversation at breakfast this morning that we have to be, we have to see nuclear looks a lot more like the airline industry. And in the airline industry, you know, Boeing may spend, you know, billions of dollars developing the 787, but that's because they know they're going to, they're going to make 800 of them and sell them around the world. We have to get to that. 
We have to get to where these technologies don't just get deployed in the U.S., but really get deployed around the world on a standardized basis with an integrated supply chain. And that's, that's to me, what the future should look like. Um, and that's not an easy future to have because we're used to this sort of stick-built, domestically-based approach to nuclear that just isn't sustainable um, in very much anymore. And so I think we do have to have international cooperation. And one of the really difficult aspects of this is if, if, if you're going to deploy the same nuclear technology around the world, that means you have to deal with some kind of licensing approach to enable that to happen. And we've got some answers to that that we're developing, but it's not going to be easy. It's going to require people to be a lot more flexible than they've been in the past. I think it's possible. I think it can be done without giving up sovereignty, without having others tell you that this is te a safe technology, just take it and trust us. But there's, there's ways of doing it, but people have to work together. So exactly the right question. You're asking, both of you asked really great, good questions, very good questions. Thank you so much, uh, Director Magwood. Uh, I think uh, if you thought this was an exciting talk, there was another talk coming up, a discussion coming up, and we talked about you know, uh, future and the vision, and thank you so much for sharing your vision and the, your perspective uh, toward the you know, uh, future of nuclear uh, technology. And uh, I think this sets a great stage for the next conversation that we're gonna have. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion in 10 minutes uh, on the topic of nuclear energy 150 years from now. In celebration of our, uh, you know, 150th anniversary, we'll talk about how nuclear energy must and will be indispensable in, uh, for the humanity to survive in the next 150 years and on and beyond. So, please, uh, there are some cookies remaining uh, on the, in the background, so uh, please do not leave, and uh, let's continue our conversation, and let's thank uh, Director Magwood once again for this great uh, conversation. Thank you very thank much. You. And happy anniversary. <laughs>